It's good to be in the house of God, amen? We're going to let these songs as reminders to our souls of who He is. This song goes like this. Your love's so great, Jesus and no I've seen a glimpse of your heart a billion years, still I'll be Nothing like the love of Jesus over our lives. Thank you, God. From the darkness, I called your name. Into darkness, your mercy came. You called me out, lifted me up. How great is your love. You bore my weakness. You took my shame. Buried my burden in fields of grace. You called me out. Then you lifted me up. How great.
Then a man laid down his life for a friend There has never been no And there will never be A God like you A love so
God, our eyes are on you this morning. We look to you, we look to the cross. We know that there's no one greater than you. There's no problem greater than you, no circumstance greater than you. You are over it all. Lord, just fix our eyes on you this morning. There's no one like you. Let's continue to worship.
brings the peace that our soul so desperately longs for. Amen. Amen. He Amen. alone brings That's peace right, to the man. chaos that is so deep in our hearts. I've experienced that this week even, and I, our prayers that you experience that as well. As you're taking your seats, we just want to take a moment in our service just to say thanks for being here. Uh, it is such a powerful thing when followers of Jesus come together in worship, and we're so grateful to be able to experience that with you. We especially want to say thanks to you if it's your first time with us. I don't know how you got here, who you came with, or why you came, but golly, we're glad you're here. If you didn't get a gift on your way in, we want to make sure you get that. So stop by our Next Steps area on your way out. It's right next to our cafe out in the lobby, and we have a gift just to say thanks for being here. Now tonight, it'll be a great night for our church family as we gather it for, to take communion at 6 p.m. in this very room. So we would love to see you come back tonight for that. This morning is also a very special morning, Pastor Ron. Uh, our pastor, Pastor Willie, preaches an annual sermon called Come Before Winter. And that happens today, if you didn't know that. Merry early Christmas. Um, so Pastor Ron, can you tell us a little bit about Come Before Winter? Sure, sure. So this is a special message this morning. It's preached every year by our pastor. And it is a reminder for us to make the most of the time that we have. Paul is writing to Timothy, his second letter. And it's shortly before he is executed for his faith. And he just says some things that he wants Timothy to keep in mind. And so uh, today, is a, it's a special uh, week for us because every year we preach, pastor preaches this message, Come Before Winter. And it's a reminder for us to make the most of the time that we have. It was March earlier uh, this year. I was sitting at a table with my dad at Starbucks and uh, he was talking to me about uh, something that he was facing. He had a tumor uh, that we would later learn was stage four cancer and it would eventually uh, take his life on July 29th. And so last year, my dad was sitting uh, here in this auditorium right over there uh, as he did every week and he listened to this message. And, uh, and so this morning I come into the morning with a kind of a heavy heart because I'm, I'm mindful of my dad and last year the reality that uh, that he was here and this year uh, he is not. And when I was sitting at Starbucks with my dad as we were talking about uh, his diagnosis and what he was facing and what we would face together, I was uh, I'm mindful of how I felt in that moment. Maybe you felt that way before. And I remember feeling that uh, that my heart was full and that I had no regrets. I told my dad that. I said, Dad, I have no regrets. Everything that I wanted to say to you, I have said. Everything I've needed to forgive you of, I have forgiven you. And everything I needed to be forgiven of, I have sought that forgiveness. And you, Dad, have graciously uh, forgiven me. And so this morning, I just, you know, my prayer for you is that, uh, that you would be mindful of the time that you have because it's limited. You'd also be mindful of the relationships in your life and to the best of your ability. Try to be at peace with those that you love and those that you would call a friend or a family. But most of all, we pray that you would be mindful of your relationship with God that is available uh, through Jesus Christ because it was because of my dad's relationship with Jesus that I wasn't grieving like everybody else would grieve, those that, who had no hope. So this morning I have hope that one day I'm going to see my father again. And so my prayer for you this morning is that you would have that same hope and that to the best of your ability with the relationships that you would have, you would make the most of that time that you have uh, with those uh, that are in your life. Now, as we kind of keep that in mind, uh, you, you remember last week, for those of you that were here, it was what we called Commitment Sunday. We made our financial commitments uh, to X150. And this was a, it's a question that we've been wrestling with, right? What will I do that, that, uh, today that will matter 150 years from now? And uh, the answer to that question is not much. But what you do to invest in the kingdom of God uh, will matter. And we're happy to report that in, on December 8th, you want to come back after the Thanksgiving holidays, on December 8th, we're going to share with you because people are still making their commitments uh, to our X150 vision. And for those of you that are new, our X150 vision is simply this. We believe that God wants us to plant 150 churches, raise up 150 champions, next generation leaders, 
and to rescue 150 children through foster care uh, and adoption by 2025. That's our vision. So if you want to take a journey with us over the next six, seven years, that's the journey that we're going on as a church, and you could be a part of that. And so we, we will report back on December 8th, Sunday morning. You want to make sure that you're here. Uh, what God has provided through uh, the faithful people of our church uh, over and across our three campuses. And so we're looking forward to that. But right now we're going to transition to our teaching time to hear that message, come before winter, as we just talked about. So get out your Bibles, and we'll get ready to receive God's Word this morning. Our lives are measured by time. Our lives are measured by seasons. It's the way God has created the universe. The earth spins at a certain rate. It is tilted uh, at just a certain uh, degree so that we know and our lives are measured by days and by weeks and months and by seasons and years. The spring becomes the summer. The summer gives way to the fall. The fall fades into winter. And winter then gives birth to another spring. Our lives are marked by seasons. In fact, you can look at our life's journey and you can see the progress of seasons in other ways. The passing of time. There is the spring of childhood and young adulthood uh, when we're growing up and maturing. There's the summer of our, our young adulthood and marrying and, for many of us, raising families and pursuing careers. There's the fall of our lives when transitions begin to happen, when changes occur. We watch children growing up and going on. And there's the winter season of our life, the final season of our life as we prepare even even for what lies beyond. And for the follower of Jesus Christ, there's the promise of another spring ahead. There's always the promise for the follower of Christ of more to come. But the reality is our lives are still marked by seasons. And knowing that and understanding that the season we're in is passing, it will give way to another. The season that we're in will come to an end knowing that informs the way we live or it should. And it should cause us to be mindful that there are some things we need to do while we still have the time. If you have your Bible, I want to invite you to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 is the last chapter of the book of 2 Timothy. It's written by Paul. We call him the apostle. That simply means the one sent out. Paul, the early champion of Christianity, that follower of Christ. Many of you know his story, how he was converted from radical, angry unbelief to becoming a preacher of the message of Jesus who planted churches and wrote more books in the Bible than any other single individual. But of all the books he wrote, 2 Timothy is most scholars agree the last one. And it's one of the most personal. He writes it to Timothy, who was probably as close to anything he ever had as a real son. He called him, in fact, his son in the faith. He helped Timothy know Christ. He helped Timothy grow in his faith in Christ. And so in 2 Timothy, he writes his last book. 2 Timothy 4, thus are his last words 
the final words, the closest thing we have to the last words of the great champion, the Apostle Paul. And it's clear he knows he's at the end. Because when he writes in 2 Timothy 4, he writes his own eulogy. He writes his own epitaph. I suppose in some sense everyone does that anyway, but in a particular way Paul does that here. It's clear he knows he's approaching the end. And he's not full of melancholy or depression. In fact, he's looking ahead to what lies beyond the grave as every follower of Christ should. But he knows that this race he's running is about to end. We're looking today in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we want to read starting in verse 6. And I want to invite you to stand with me across all of our campuses as we honor these words, believing they are the inspired words of God to us. Paul writes, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure is close. I have fought the good fight I have finished the race I have kept the faith there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge will give me on that day and not only to me but to all those who have loved his appearing make every effort to come to me soon and then if you skip down to verse 21 he gets even more specific when he says, make every effort to come before winter. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the words of Scripture to us, knowing that in each and every verse you speak to us. We can learn your truth and apply it to our lives. So even from these words, from this great man to another great man written so long ago, Help us to see you have something to say to us and give us ears to hear so that in our own way we can come before winter. This is our prayer and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. So you have here Paul writing what amounts to his final words and he makes a request. Did you see it there? Did you, did you see it in verse 9? Make every effort to come to me soon. That's what the Christian Standard Bible translates the word as. Some translations have to come quickly. It means to come urgently. And then in verse 21, the same request but more specific. Come before winter. Timothy is a pastor in Ephesus, some 1,200 miles from where Paul is imprisoned at Rome. By this point, Timothy has an important role, leading an important and growing church there in Ephesus. And yet, he reads these words, come before winter. Maybe it was already the fall of the year when he read those words. Maybe he already felt a cool breeze in the air. Maybe he was already noticing the shortening of the days. And he reads this this urgent request. Come quickly, come before winter. Now, all of us know what it's like to make a casual request. In polite society, we might say things like, well, come see us. Or if you're in the neighborhood, drop by. Which really what we're saying is, look, if you ever happen to be in the area and it's not inconvenient and you actually have margin in your schedule, and by the way, we also have margin in our schedule, maybe we can get together and have a cup of coffee, and you say that without any real expectation that it's going to happen. That's not the kind of request we're reading here. Come quickly means drop everything you're doing and come. Come now. This is the call at 2 a.m. from a friend saying, I need to talk with you right now. This is the urgent appeal of a loved one who says, I need you to just change your schedule, alter your priorities, and get here quickly. This is the call from the doctor to the family. If you're going to come, you need to come right now. Timothy hears this appeal, come before winter. There's a schedule affixed to that. It means Come before a date on the calendar. Come before the winter sets in. Why did Paul make such an urgent request? That's that's the question of the morning. 
Why did Paul make this specific appeal to come quickly and this specific appeal to come before winter? Are there any clues in the text that help us understand why Paul was making this urgent appeal? And do those things speak to us this morning? I think there are and they do. There are two things that Paul clearly understood that I think it's important for every one of us to understand. The first thing, it's clear Paul understood that he didn't have long to live. Paul understood that life, his life, was brief. And it underscores the reality for every one of us that life is, in fact, brief. Paul knew he was going to die. The Bible tells us in the book of Psalms 90 and verse 12 that we are supposed to number our days, to count our days. That means there are a certain number of days we all have. You don't know how many days you have, but there's a finite number. It doesn't mean you can ever discern the exact number, but it means to be mindful of the reality that our days are limited. Like grains of sand in an hourglass, there's a certain number of them, and you may not know how many, but they are passing. You're to be mindful of that. Paul was, he knew his hourglass was about empty. He says it in verses 6, 7, and 8. This is a man who knows he's at the end. He says exactly that in verse 6. I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. A drink offering was exactly what you think it is, a liquid offering. Some of the offerings that the Jewish people would give were liquid offerings that literally would be poured out on the ground as a participation in worship, as a sign of worship to the Lord. And you can imagine a large picture, a large uh, a bowl of, of water being poured out on the ground. And that's Paul saying, that's my life. I'm being poured out on the ground. I've already, I'm just about gone. He says, the time for my departure is close. It's at hand. He's not talking about a bus. He's talking about his death. This is a man who knows it's close. And then he writes his own epitaph. And what a beautiful one it is. I have fought the good fight. Notice the past tense. I'm not fighting the good fight. He knows most of his fight's over. I fought it. I finished the race. Again, notice the past tense. I finished the race. He knows his race is nearly run. I kept the faith. And then again in verse 8, Paul is not full of depression or melancholy like some might imagine. In fact, according to verse 8, he's looking beyond the grave, isn't he? He's looking forward to eternity. He says, the crown of life is laid up for me. And then he encourages us by saying, and not just for me, but for all those who have loved his appearing. He's saying to those who are in Christ, we have the hope of spring beyond winter. We have the hope of life beyond this life. For the follower of Jesus Christ, the best is always yet to come. Paul knows he's about, though, to end his earthly journey. And it's on the heels of that that he makes this request. According to our best sources, Paul was imprisoned in Rome at least twice. And his second imprisonment probably happened somewhere around the mid-60s, 64 to 67 A.D., there are a couple of different Christian traditions according to how Paul died. It is not recorded for us in the Bible, of course. The most commonly accepted one comes from an ancient church historian, Eusebius. Eusebius claimed that Paul was beheaded at the order of the Roman emperor Nero shortly after the time that Rome burned in a fire, an event that Nero blamed on the Christians. The fire at Rome occurred in about 64 A.D. Nero's death occurred in 68 A.D. So somewhere in that 64 to 67 imprisonment is where probably Paul lost his life. And apparently as Paul writes this letter, he knows it's his last one, and he's sending it to Timothy, his son in the faith, he knows he doesn't have much longer. I don't know if he had just an impression that the Lord gives some people that I don't have much longer. Maybe he had that. Maybe it was just a natural sense that you tend to have. He could look at what was happening politically. He knew what was happening around him. Maybe he just knew, I don't have much longer. And so he writes to Timothy to say, I don't have much longer to live. 
If you're going to come, you have to come quickly. If you're going to come, you have to come before winter because I don't have much longer. Some of us say, well, that's an interesting story, Pastor, about Paul and Maybe you've known somebody who was close to the end and they knew it. But you know what a lot of us are thinking this morning? A lot of us are thinking, I don't know what that has to do with me. A lot of us are going, well, that's interesting, but I don't know what it has to do with me because I've still got a long time to go. Well, I hope you do. But here's what everyone should know. We have many students here this morning. It's always so good to see our students here. And we'll have many college students in the next service. We have many students across all of our campuses. And some of you are going, well, I don't know, you know, that's interesting. Paul's at the end of his life. But I got many, many years. Some of you are young adults. I got many, many years to go. Well, here's what you need to know. Number one, you don't know how many grains of sand you have in the hourglass. No one does. And secondly, even if you have a lot of them, they go really fast. They go a lot faster than you think. The truth is, for all of us, life is brief. It wasn't long ago that we honored the life of the great evangelist Billy Graham, who passed away in his 90s. And when he was asked about what surprised him in life, in one of the last interviews he gave, he said, the greatest surprise in life to me is the brevity of life. He said, I never thought I would live to be this old, and I never dreamed how quickly it would go. The book of James echoes that in James 4 and verse 14 in the New Living Translation. It translates it this way, your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, and then it's gone. Shakespeare wrote, out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow goes by very, very fast. And you can't help but think about that during the holiday season. You just can't help it. I mean, this is the week where the holiday season begins. If you're listening to this message at some time in the future, this is the Sunday before Thanksgiving. And so it really marks the beginning of the holiday season. Now, some of you are heretics, and you have begun to listen to Christmas music before Thanksgiving. (laughs) And you need to repent before God (laughs) and wait until Thanksgiving the way the Lord intended. But wherever you really begin the holiday season, the truth is you think about the end of the year, the passing of time. I I think about how quickly it goes because do you remember? And here's what those people, if if you start this before Thanksgiving, you're just putting torture on your kids. Don't you understand? It just, do you remember being a kid at Christmas and it just seemed like it was, it was like time was moving so slow. Putting up the tree, putting in the presents out. It was just like dangling a carrot in front of you and telling you to wait. Boy, did it drag. Weeks would go by. And you couldn't wait for Christmas to get here. The Advent season starts next week. Four wonderful Christmas Sundays. I hope you'll be a part of every one of them at Calvary. We'll celebrate this season starting next weekend. But when you're a kid, boy, it just seems like forever. But then you get older, don't you? You get older, and it's like now some of you, you don't even put your Christmas decorations away because it's like it's just going to be here in a few days, <laughs> right? So why, the, you just don't have the energy anymore. Just leave it there. The reality is time does seem to go by faster and faster. It's not that the earth is spinning any faster, but our perception of time absolutely does change. If you're 10, one year is just one-tenth of your life. So that's a lot. If you're 50, it's one-fiftieth of your life. That didn't seem like all that much. Life goes by fast. And I remember being young. Do you remember? And, and, and uh, you're in a school and you couldn't wait to graduate. Or you thought, man, I'll never make four years. Are you kidding me? Or you're counting down when you got, we're going to get married you maybe you just had a little calendar and you're crossing off the days or waiting for that first child. Do you remember those early stages where you would wait for something big to happen? It would just seem like it'll never get here. And then there are older people, right? And they would tell you stuff like, oh, time flies. 
you'd have two or three little kids running around, just throwing up on things, making a mess, <laughs> aggravating you, and you just, oh, this. And, and older people say, oh, you better enjoy it. It'll be gone soon. And you thought, they're lying. <laughs> That's what old people do. They get old, they lose their hair, and they lie. That's what they do. But then one day you noticed it really did happen that way. Suddenly the little kids aren't little so more and you don't even know where it happened. And then the next thing you know, they're, they're growing up themselves. And the next thing you know, all the stuff you were complaining about in the garage is all gone. And the next thing you know, they've grown and, and you find yourself, you look at a mirror and go, how did this happen to me? And you ask somebody this morning, they'll tell you, that Dr. Graham was right. One of the greatest surprises is it happens so very quickly. James is right. It's like the morning fog. It's here and it's gone. It's gone. So for those of us who think, oh, I have lots of time to live, maybe not as much as you think because, again, none of us know. Two years ago, I saw a CNN article that gave the life expectancy in the United States. This is from December of 2017. It was now 78.6 years. That's the average life expectancy. Higher for women, lower for men. It's actually decreased for two years running, or excuse me, three years running, which is the first time in many, many years. 78.6. I do this every year. I get asked to do it. If your life was a day, you're born right after midnight, you got one day to live, where would you be on that day if you lived an average number of years? And some of you will live much longer, and I'm grateful for that. You're like the old football coach, Bobby Bowden, who when told he was in the fourth quarter of his career, said, well, I'm praying for overtime. <laughs> well, I hope you get overtime. But 78.6 isn't promised to any of us, and some of us won't have those. If you're 20 and you lived an average life, it's 6.15 in the morning in one 24-hour day. If you're 30, it's 9.22 in the morning. If you're 40, it's 12.30. If you're 50, it's 3.38 in the afternoon. If you're 60, it's 6.45 in the evening. If you're 70, it's 9.53 in the evening. And if you're 75, it's just after 11 o'clock. An hour before midnight. Life goes by so very fast. Paul knew that and you should too. And the second thing he knew is that opportunities are limited. That opportunities are limited. That things that you can do today you won't always be able to do. The doors that are open today won't always be open. When Paul wrote come before winter, why did he fixate on winter? Well, if you have studied your Bible, you would know why. In the book of Acts, there's a story. And in that story, Paul had been arrested and brought to prison in a place called Caesarea. And then he was taken from Caesarea to Rome on a ship. And that ship sailed late in the fall or early in the winter. In fact, they sailed because there was a warm wind blowing. Paul warned them not to. And they ran right into a fierce storm like a hurricane. The ship was eventually wrecked. And the people on the ship survived by swimming to a nearby island on the wreckage. Paul had been in shipwrecks, and he knew what we know from history, and that is this. The Mediterranean Sea has great storms, and their storm season is during the winter months. It's during the winter that the cold winds blow down south off the European mountains, and they collide with the warm air coming up north off the African deserts. And suddenly, quickly, without much warning at all, fierce storms can erupt. And for that reason, you didn't typically sail in the winter. It was too dangerous. Those who were sailing would harbor themselves for weeks or a month or two during the winter months it was their storm season and you didn't risk sailing during the winter you waited until it warmed back up 
When Paul is saying, come before winter, there is something that can be inferred from that request. And it is this. Paul knew that if Timothy didn't get on a ship and sail to Rome before the winter, then he wouldn't be able to come all winter. And he would have to wait until the spring. And the implication is, if he waited until the spring, it would be too late. What Paul is in effect saying to Timothy is, I know I won't last through this winter. For me, winter marks the end. And if you're going to get here, you better come now. You better come fast. You better come quickly. You better come before winter. Because when winter comes, the door is shut. When winter comes, the opportunity is lost. When winter comes, it'll be over. Some opportunities must be seized. And if they're not seized today, they're lost forever. There are some areas in your life where you need to come before winter. And I just wonder this morning on this, this weekend that begins to get us into the holiday season and Thanksgiving and Christmas and all of that and the joy of it and the stress of it and all the things that come with it. I just wonder, are there some areas where you and I need to come before winter? And as you study the writings of Paul, I think there are. I think there are three areas that really jump out where you need to come before winter. And on an annual basis, as our pastors perhaps have shared in our campuses, on an annual basis, I've tried to share this message. It's kind of become a Calvary custom of ways in which you need to come while you still have the chance. Number one, you need to seize your opportunities. If you're gonna come before winter in your life, understanding the brevity of life, understanding the brevity of opportunity, you need to seize the opportunities that are yours. There are some opportunities that if not seized today are lost forever. I think a lot of things we should wait on and be careful about. But in other things we need to sees while we have the chance. I was reading a story written by a man named Arthur. This was decades ago. Arthur had a friend named Walter who was a kind of an artist, kind of a dreamer type. And he wrote later on about when his friend Walter drove him out to the countryside. Arthur wrote, I drove off the main road. We drove through groves of trees to a large uninhabited expanse of land. There were horses grazing. There were a couple of old shacks that remained. Walter stopped the car, got out, tried to describe with great vividness the wonderful things he intended to build. He wanted his friend Arthur to buy some of the land surrounding the project. Arthur said, I thought, who in the world is going to drive 25 miles for this crazy project? The logistics were staggering. Walter said to his friend, I'm handling the project by myself, but it takes all my money. The land bordering it, though, where we're standing now, will in a couple of years be incredibly valuable. It will be jammed with hotels and restaurants and convention halls. And he said, I want you as my friend to have the first chance at this surrounding acreage because in the next five years it will increase in value several hundred times. Arthur later wrote, what could I say to my friend? I knew he was wrong. I knew he had let his dream get the best of his common sense. So I mumbled something about a tight money situation and promised I would look into the whole thing a little later on. Later on will be too late, Walter said. And he cautioned Arthur as they walked back to the car, if you want this, you need to move on it right now. But Arthur, who was a man by the name of Art Linkletter, some of you older folks will remember Art Linkletter, later reflected on the opportunity that he had to buy up the land surrounding what would become Disneyland in Southern California. His friend Walter... Walt Disney would change the entertainment world. And Arthur looked back on that, Art Linkletter did, and said, I miss perhaps the greatest financial opportunity of my life. Now, I think there are a lot of things you ought to wait and be careful on. A lot of people have made mistakes getting in a hurry. But I want to tell you there are some things you need to seize while you have the chance. 
There are some things that you know God has spoken to you about. There are some things that you know God is calling you to do. And I'm just reminding you today that in those things that God is calling you to do, you need to be obedient today or risk those opportunities being lost. Paul wrote in another book, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15, be Pay careful attention then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time. T.S. Eliot wrote, footfalls echo in the memory down the passage we did not take toward the doors we never opened. John Greenleaf Whittier wrote, for all the sad words of tongue and pen, the saddest are these. It might have been. Lecrae, the Christian artist, said, even in our best shape, we are a brittle piece of mortality. Your life is a breath. A breath. Don't waste it. One of my favorite stories was told by Florence Litauer some years ago about her mother-in-law in a nursing home. She had lost some of her mental acuity and was losing grip on reality, but as sometimes people do, they, she remembered her youth well. And she said, I would visit my mother-in-law and she would sing. I'd never known my mother-in-law to sing. And all the time I knew her, she had never sung. I didn't know she had any talent. But she would sing there in the nursing home. And she wasn't bad. Obviously, she was in her senior years, but she wasn't bad. She had memorized operas. I knew, I didn't know it. But apparently as a child, as a young woman, she had memorized these operas. And I later found out by talking to family members, she had in her youth fantasized about singing and hoped even to be an opera singer. And she was pretty good, actually. She would sing there. People would come to hear her sing there in the nursing center. She said, I thought how tragic it was, though, that she lived her life without pursuing a dream. And then she wrote this. She said, my mother died with a talent undeveloped, a dream unfulfilled. She died with the song still in her. I wonder what song is in you. I wonder what it is God is calling you to do. And, and I, sometimes when the devil tries to tempt us, he doesn't say, don't do it. You know what he says? Just wait. You'll have another time. You'll have another year. There's time to pursue it. And the years, they're flying by. And the opportunity that's there will be lost. The opportunity to tell somebody about your faith. The opportunity to start that ministry. The opportunity to get involved in that project. To do something your heart and the Spirit of God in you is calling you to do. If winter's coming and it is, you need to seize your opportunities. Number two, you need to cherish your relationships. You need to cherish your relationships. It was Paul's close relationship to Timothy that motivated him to write. And at the end of your life, when you think back on your life, it won't be the projects that you value the most. No one on their deathbed says, please bring me my checkbook. I'd like to look at it one more time. Nobody is looking for one more client or one more business deal. It's our relationships that we cherish the most. I once spoke to a pastor who had to go through a season in his life where he altered his priorities. And he said, what grabbed me was I realized I was running and about to run my life over the edge to please people who probably wouldn't even show up at my funeral. And he said, I was neglecting the woman who would probably be in my hospital room cleaning my bedpan if she needed to. He said, I changed my priorities. When you think about the passing of time, it'll do that. And the thing that you will realize is you need to cherish your relationships. Paul knew all about that. It says in Acts 20 and verse 37, when he visited in Ephesus for the very last time, and he met the elders there in Ephesus in Acts 20, 37, it says they embraced Paul and kissed him and were grieving most over his statement. They would never see his face again. There are people here today we might never get to see again. I'm not trying to be ominous. I'm certainly not trying to be frightening. I'm just telling you the truth. These moments and these upcoming weeks are a reminder. Life is brief and opportunities are limited. 
So what does it mean in our relationship? It means some things need to be said. There are people who are sitting here today who would give anything if they had one more opportunity to say to somebody they love the things they really want to say. Live without regrets. If there are things that need to be said to people in your life, people that have blessed you, make sure you don't miss the opportunities to say them. I remember reading of a writer who said, I, I, I don't know when the last time was that my little girl just sat up on my lap. You know how kids will just crawl up into your lap. And there's a period in their life when they can really crawl up into your lap. You know, I mean the whole thing. Just cuddle right there and you can hold them right there in your arms. He said, I don't remember the last time I held my little girl and I could wrap my arms around her and she fit right there in my lap. But if I had known it was the last time, I would have held on a little longer. I'm just reminding you the last time eventually comes. The last conversation eventually comes. The last goodbye, the last holiday eventually comes. If you got something to say, say it. And I also just want to say, if there are priorities that need to be set, set the right priorities in your life. This is a time to speak to young families, and I always do, and especially I want to speak to younger fathers, younger mothers also. You're climbing a ladder. You're wanting to succeed. You're wanting to grab a hold of something. You're wanting to make a name for yourself. And I get that. There's nothing wrong with a, a, a healthy ambition as long as we want to glorify the Lord and serve his purposes. We want to excel. We want to succeed. And we want to work very hard. And I'm glad for all of that. There's nothing wrong with that. But listen, do not neglect the most important things because I promise you, at the end, it comes down to the same stuff for every one of us, relationships. With God, our family, and our friends. It's the same for every one of us. Don't waste these years chasing after something that isn't going to matter and neglecting the things that do. Somebody could probably take your job and do as good or better than you. But there are some jobs that are irreplaceable. Nobody could be a father to those kids that you are or a mom to those kids. That's your most important role, and that will be your lasting legacy. And I just want to remind you, make sure your priorities are set. And then finally, there's some divisions that need to be healed. And I only say this because I've seen through the years how God has used this message to remind people. Sometimes in relationships, things get out of whack. Sometimes we don't even know why or how it happened. But there are things that happen in families and siblings that don't speak and people that are angry with one another. And I understand the Bible says as much as it depends on you, live at peace with every man, which means you can't control everything. You can't control everything. But what you can control, you should. And I can tell you story after story. I've had many people, I heard, had a story of a woman who came to me and said, Pastor, I hadn't spoke to my sister in more than 20 years. This happened three or four years ago. And after you preached that message, I determined to reach out to her. And she sent a letter, which was followed up by a call, and a relationship was restored. Look, I, I, you know, I understand boundaries need to be set. I understand there's some dysfunctional things you can't change. But you know what? There are some divisions that could be healed if you would just get off your high horse of pride. Write a letter. Humble yourself. Ask yourself at the end, what's really going to matter? You think you're going to be at your deathbed and go, I was right. Think that's going to matter? It's not going to matter. But the relationships that are lost, those things could matter. So I'm just telling you, if the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart and there's someone you need to call, there's a letter you need to write, there's an apology you need to make, if you need to humble yourself, do it while you still have the time. Because winter's coming. And when it comes that opportunity will be lost. Let me give you the last thing you need to do before winter comes, and that is you need to trust in God. You need to trust in God. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, the right time is now. 
Today is the day of salvation. The greatest thing you need to do is make sure your relationship with God is right. You know, everybody ought to walk through a cemetery every once in a while. It's a good thing. I'm talking about an old-fashioned one. And church cemeteries are the best ones. I found myself doing it this past summer. We were in Birmingham, Alabama for some meetings and one evening we drove out to our very first church where Cheryl and I, before we had any kids, we pastored, we were just kids. I was 20 years old when I became their pastor. They pastored me more than I pastored them. We were there for three and a half beautiful, wonderful years living out in the country. It's the only church I ever pastored that had a cemetery right next to it. I didn't think about it much at the time, I do now. It was a late summer evening, one of those summer evenings out there in the Alabama hills where the daylight's lingering, just a few more moments. And Cheryl and I got alone, we walked out there, it was a Wednesday night, there were meetings going on at the church, but nobody saw us out on the corner. We parked the car, I got up and I walked through that old cemetery. It wasn't long before tears were rolling down my cheeks. I was just crying. I'd walk by this family and I remembered them and I walked by that one and I remembered them and I walked by that one. People I had pastored. I thought 30 years have come and gone. These people meant so much to me. How quickly it's gone. And I was full of joy. I knew I'd see them again one day. That's the hope that we have in Christ. The end will come for all of us. The question is, is there hope beyond the grave? For Paul, there was. This this is not a message of just empty sentimentality. For Paul, there was the hope of a crown of life laid up for me. You too can have that hope that beyond the winter is another spring that is going to come. But here's the key. There is no other name given unto men by which you must be saved but the name of Jesus Christ. There is no one else who can promise you this. I am the resurrection and the life and whoever believes in me will never die. Jesus makes that promise of a spring beyond a winter. But if you want to experience it, then you need to make sure that before winter comes in your life, You've bowed your head and you've bent your knee and you have prayed and put your trust in the one who can forgive you, in the one who can save you, in the one who made the seasons and can give you a spring beyond this one. And if you've never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that today you will. I pray you'll humble yourself and put your faith in him for only he can forgive you. Only he can give you peace in God. I pray that you'll trust him. I pray you'll do it now. I pray that you'll do it quick. I pray that you will do it before winter comes. Would you pray with me this morning? Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And if you're here today across all three of our campuses and you've never opened your heart to trust in the Lord, I want to encourage you to do that today your prayer could be a simple prayer just like this lord jesus i believe that you died on the cross for my sin you died in my place and i believe you are the lord and today i ask you to come into my heart and today i ask you to forgive me of my sin i want to put my trust in you while i have the chance to do it If you prayed that prayer across any of our campuses, in a moment, our campus pastors will come and they'll tell you exactly how you can take that step of faith, how you can let us know that you're making that decision. If you're a follower of Christ, I pray that today your heart will be open to the voice of the Holy Spirit so that as he speaks to you, you can hear his voice and do what must be done to seize that opportunity, to cherish that relationship, to obey God while you have the chance before winter comes. Thank you, Father, for reminding us of the passing of the season. Help us to do what must be done today while we have that moment before winter comes is our prayer in Jesus' sweet name. Amen and amen. Our campus pastors are taking it at our campuses here at Clearwater. I want you to know we're going to sing in just a moment. And our ushers are coming, our volunteers. They're going to receive an offering in just a moment like we always do at this point in our service. But if you're here today and you're making a decision, can I tell you three ways you can let us know? 
One, you can come during this song or after this song. At the front are members of our prayer team who would love to pray with you. You can come during the song. You can come after the song, after the service is dismissed. We have pastors and a prayer team leaders right here who love to pray with you. Come and tell one of them, today I put my trust in Jesus. I want to follow Christ. We'd love to help you take that next step with the Lord. You can use the card, the next step card that's throughout the building. Use that card to indicate the decision you want to make. And you put that in the offering we're going to receive right now. Let that be a record so that we can just follow up with you with a text or an email to find out how we can encourage you in your relationship with Christ. Or you can stop by our next step area out in the lobby. But we'd love for you to tell somebody about the decision you need to make. While we sing this, I pray you'll be thinking, God, what do I need to do in my life before winter comes? And determine in your heart to do it. Oh, Father, bless our offering. Bless our worship. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us in this season of our life. We are grateful in the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray it. Amen and amen. Let's stand together as we sing this. Let's sing. You lead me home in your presence where I belong. You call me out, lifted me up. How great is your love? From the heights of heaven, you step down to earth. In a sin perfection, leave your life for us. We are amazed. Yes, we stand in awe. For we have been changed by the power of the cross. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love for great to see you this morning. We're so glad that you're here. Remember, if this is your first time, we have a gift for you. We'd love to see you at the Next Steps area. Please stop by there on your way out this morning. And then also, Pastor's uh, Journals uh, for devotionals for the following year, 2020, uh, have just come in. They're available for you at the Resource Center if you want to pick one of those up. Uh, they're $20, and so this will be a great gift for Christmas. So make sure you grab one on the way out. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. We'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock for our communion service. God bless you as you go to Bible study.